Broadcasting from the campus of Salisbury University, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7, putting Delmarva first. It's one of the richest towns in Delaware, but Hinlopen Acres finds itself at odds with Rehoboth Art League. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Hinlopen Acres began as a small planned community in the 1930s, ultimately incorporated in the 1970s, and its per capita income is just over $82,000 a year. It sits against the Atlantic coast with Rehoboth to the east and Lewis to the west, and inside this enclave is the home of the Rehoboth Art League. The land that its facilities are lake located on is classified as a non-conforming use, and that has placed it under tight restrictions and questions about its future. To talk about the dispute, we have in our studio Sheila Bravo. She's the executive director of the Art League. Also, uh, Lee Miles, he's a longtime member and also an artist himself. We did put out requests uh, to the town manager, Tom Roth, but have so far not received a response. Also, the Delaware Estate Planning Coordinator, Connie Holland, and the attorney for the Art League, Mark Dunkel, had conflicting schedules, so they were not uh, able to be here. But welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, I, I want to sort of reach back before we get into the whole dispute business, and, and maybe Lee, you're, you're the guy to talk to about this. Tell me about the origin of the Art League and, it, and its history. I mean, when, when did it come about, and how has it been integrated into the, into the surrounding area? Well, it came about... Largely because uh, a number of the members of the Brandywine School associated with the Wyas, uh, and particularly Howard Pyle, summered in Rehoboth, came down and vacationed there. And uh, one of his um, strongest protégés was Ethel P.B. Leach, and she bought a home in Rehoboth, and she became very, very good friends with Louise Corcoran, who was the other founder of the Rehoboth Art League. They both work with the uh, Village Improvement Association, um, sponsoring art shows. Um, make a long story short, uh, one, of the, one of the established things that they did for a number of years was, was uh, a show on the, uh, on the boardwalk uh, of Rehoboth Beach. And that has since morphed into what we call our summer exhibit, or our outdoor show in, in the middle two weeks of August. Uh, as the as the art league developed, um, Ethel was um, was an accomplished artist and um, well respected throughout the the United States. Was published uh, often and long. Um, it, to try to give you some sense of uh, it, she was she was probably the strongest person that was working with Howard Pyle when he was phenomenally um, well known and a very very wealthy artist illustrator. And he left uh, the Wilmington studio in her care when he decided to uh, take a two-year sabbatical and go to Italy. Unfortunately, he got very, very ill there and passed away. And and Ethel P.B. Leach and her friend Olive Rush, another very, very well-known um, artist, um, ran the, the Pyle studio for a number of years after that. And it has since morphed into the studio uh, which is uh, a local organization of, of Wilmington regional artists. Um, and so so there's always been that sort of uh, two-way street between connections with the Brandywine School and with Rehoboth, um, largely because we're, we're a summer colony. But now, now Rehoboth is very much a year-round community, and a lot of artists have retired there, and a lot of us are working there constantly and continuously. And tell me Lynn, a little bit about the uh, – how did it come about in terms of locating an actual facility then in, in Hindle Bay? Well, the the thing was when the Corcorans moved uh, – to Delaware, um, they bought the land that is Henlope and Acres, and Colonel Corcoran um, acted as the civil engineer to draw up the plans for the lots and the streets and things like that and started marketing it. Um, and But the plan always was to have the Art League there, and they made – uh, they made land available to the Art League right next to their own homestead, the old mansion that, uh, you know, is is the heart of our campus. And uh, and when he passed away and she she was left to uh, 
to continue on. And when she later passed away, uh, the will was drawn up so that the Art League got uh, got the land and the buildings that had been developed for studio space, for exhibition space, for all that kind of thing. Sheila, strive for me the the, the, the current structure, the the, stru- the the actual physical structure of the buildings that we're talking about here. Uh, sure. Well, the Rehoboth Art League, we are um, an education institution, and we're also an exhibition institution for art, and uh, provide a variety of different cultural art and cultural activities throughout the year. So uh, the property is uh, a little under four acres and has, uh, as Lee mentioned, the historic uh, Peter Marsh Homestead and some historic gardens that uh, Louise Corcoran created. And then we have several buildings that um, encompass our classrooms and exhibition uh, buildings. One in particular, really the founding of the Rehoboth Art League was back in the 1930s, and they needed a classroom space, so they brought a building over from Lewis uh, that was formerly part of the William Painter Estate, which we now call the Painter Studio. The story is they floated it down the canal because a local farmer wouldn't permit them to 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 move the building across this field. And so Colonel Corcoran and Louise Corcoran and many of the community members brought that little building and, and for about 10 years served as our only studio, a really tiny little um, 1700 building that uh, served as our first classroom. And then about 10 years later, um, the Art League was starting to grow more and more and um, the Corcorans decided to create what we now call the Corcoran Building. Uh, Colonel Corcoran developed the plans himself, and that uh, started off as studio space, but then again, as we continued to grow, eventually became exhibition space, and we have a couple of offices in there. And that sits right at the base of, of, the, uh, of the historic campus. And then in the 1960s, our newest building is called the Chambers Building, um, after Louise's maiden name. And that is, uh, we have a working, uh, an active pottery studio um, where artists and potters can come in um, a regular basis to use that studio space. And then we have a painting um, studio for, for our different classrooms and everything. So, um, and then I guess the final building, which, which we don't want to forget, is uh, what was back in the 1700s, 1800s, probably a um, what we call the stables, but it probably housed animals and farm equipment back when the property was farmland. Um, we now call the stables, and um, and it sits next to the homestead. And it uh, just recently we is going through historic restoration to serve as a place to store the Rehoboth Art League's uh, art collection. Because as an institution that has been around for over 75 years, with many of these accomplished artists that have been part of the uh, art scene, the Art League has collected um, their works and um, and their stories over the decades, and so we have a pretty fine collection of early 20th century artwork, as well as uh, a pretty robust archive of the art and cultural scene over the past seven decades in uh, Southern Delaware. So then, now describe for me. Now we've got the, the structure of the buildings. So what is the surrounding area then like, and how does that fit into? As you move out, I mean, is there, are, are there wooded areas and, and, and where, how close are residential areas? What Describe that situation, that location for me. The Rehoboth Art League is actually, if you looked at a map of Henlopen Acres, and Henlopen Acres as a town is about, I believe, 200 properties. And that includes a marina, which the Art League um, is next to the marina, um, and, um, and then a lot of houses. So over the decades... As Colonel Corcoran started to promote his residential community and and then it eventually became a town, uh, homeowners came in and purchased properties. So the Art League is surrounded both by uh, residences as well as the the marina along one side of it. And and how close are the residences to to your own structure? They're across the street. Um, The Art League property uh, is actually... Um, on two sides is uh, next to the street, and then there's um, undeveloped property next to us. And then there's two houses um, on the back end of our property near the Homestead Gardens. So I guess, so how did this dispute begin? I mean, because, I mean, obviously you you folks have been there a very, very long period of time. You have this non-conforming use, and you can get into what the definition is there. And, and, and why is it that, that for years you've been there, and then now we've come to this point where there's some question about the zoning of the land, the planning, the comprehensive plan? What what? Give me some sense of history there. Well, um, 
I haven't. I've been with the Art League for five years, so this predates me right. by many years. I think that first of all, I, I do want to say that the the residents of the town have been very supportive of the Art League over the years. Many of them volunteer, as as Lee mentioned, even in the early days when the Corcorans. Uh, look to invite somebody to live in the community. The first thing they would they would interview them to see if they were supportive of artists and art and and the arts. Um, I think that um, and 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 I think many cultural institutions face this when communities grow up around them, that there becomes concerns about traffic, and and in what way the organization is going to impact the quality of life in the area. And I think as turnover of homeowners came that um, the the connectivity of people who came in there to be part of an art colony probably started to dissipate. Um, I think that there certainly was a dramatic change when the community became an actual town in the 1970s because by that nature they had the responsibility to set um, ordinances and codes and by labeling our property and our uses as nonconforming that began a process that I think has created some of the tension because in the zoning codes of the town, the intent is to get rid of nonconforming uses and to get rid of nonconforming structures. And one of the reasons why we raised the concern is in their comprehensive plan, which is kind of like a strategic plan for towns, they they indicate what their future land use plans are and they show us going away. And that's where we felt that, um, well, we didn't like that, obviously. <laughs> We've been around for a long time. And again, many property owners felt the same way, that the, the, the plan of the town should not be to see us go away. The plan of the town should be to embrace and, and preserve us. And that's why we, we brought up the, the zoning request, because that has been a process typically that towns use to identify districts that have perhaps a different set of rules and regulations than other parts of a community. Now, now, when you say that they, they, they have this comprehensive plan and basically you disappear, what do you, I mean, how are they making you disappear? What, what, how does, how does that work? The, um, well, they can't just right. I mean, wave they can't, a magic right. wand. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the comprehensive plan, and again, I'm not in the government, so I, I'm really speaking from a lay person's sure. point of view. The, uh, the comprehensive plan, as I said, states their strategic plan for land use. And so today they show a map. And on that map, they show the properties of the town and indicate what districts they're in. And they indicate also what uses are permitted. So today, in, on the section of the map that shows our property, they label it as an institutional use. Just like the marina and the beach club have different uses and the, the town of Henlopen Acres government buildings have an, a use. In the future land use map, they show our use as residential. And so that right there is, is the future intent is to move it to residential. Then if you look within the codes, there are um, zoning ordinances that again are structured so that the non-conforming structures within the residential area eventually go away and the and the non-conforming uses. And that's where we felt by creating a special cultural district, just as they did with the Beach Club, that, which is a recreational district, would be a way to solve that. Because again, even the, even the town leadership has has expressed that they value the Art League, they value uh, what it brings to the community. So it, it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect, and um, and we just hope that um, as we we raise this issue and this concern that the the government officials will will see that it it would it would ultimately serve a good purpose to to design a district that would preserve our this really cultural treasure that's located not only to benefit the property owners of Henlopen and Acres but really the broader community that comes to visit and and that lives there. Lee, what about this relationship between the the Art League and its structure on, on the one hand and the residences and the communities on the other hand? You've been you, – because you've been a, a member of the mm. League for a very long time. I think you were named mm. a director at one point, and certainly you're an artist. How do you evaluate that relationship over the years, and, and has it changed? I mean, what's what, – what's, What's happened here? Or, or, I mean, how significant is the league in terms of those people who live nearby it? 
Um, I, I actually believe that the, the league has functioned pretty much at the same level it always has. I mean, they've done a very good job supporting artists in the community. Our programming has done a wonderful job of uh, teaching young people their first art lessons, of providing um, serious artists with good exhibition opportunities. Um, our outdoor show does impact the community probably more than any other event that we have over the year. Um, but it is a contained thing in the sense that our campus is only the three and a half acres. The number of artists that show with us every summer is the same number that has been for the last 20-some years. The thing is, is that Rehoboth and the general area itself has grown in population, so more people want to avail themselves of the opportunity of meeting and seeing those artists and looking and purchasing art over those two weekends. And so that impact is rather strong and probably, in a way, seems more pronounced. But the, the event itself is no bigger nor any smaller than it has ever been. It's just that the impact of the, of the community that we serve um, it, it registers a little higher on whatever meter that they're, they're um, registering it on. Um, yeah, as I say, I'm just, uh, I'm just a volunteer there now and a member, uh, but I love the place dearly, and I'm really sorry that this kind of confliction has happened. Um, I, I have my own personal opinions. I, I think, you know, it was a modest little town when it started, and, uh, and the demographic of the owners of those houses has changed. A lot of them have passed away. A lot even of their heirs now no longer own property. But the fact is the property is some of the, the, the sweetest land in the region, and it's very much in demand, and it's very, very expensive property. And so it's a major line item in people's portfolios. So they're, they protect it and guard it in a way that they didn't say in 1956 or even in 1977. Do you get sense, by the way, as to what neighbors are sensing about the about the league i mean is is there a growing concern that perhaps there's an issue with the league being nearby over the years i mean what cause you obviously interact with the community i mean what's well that's where yeah. i have a personal disconnect cuz yeah. cuz like in 2007 and 8 when i was the interim executive director for a time came off the board to to do that when our long-term executive de- director resigned um, I was I was dealing with with the community and um, there was enormous support and enormous affection and by and large by any measure today whatever litmus test we put it to it it still seems to be there yet somehow this conflict has has arisen I I do not know where it comes from um, almost all of the adjoining property people or the people that are nearby are members of the art league are supporters of the art league uh so i it it remains something of a mystery to me how how this uh this problem has developed into the the standoff where it seems to be right now sheila what about that i mean we as we indicated we certainly invited the the town manager tom roth on to talk about this uh do the town officials have they given you some Indication as to why this shift has occurred or what their intent is? I mean, what have those conversations been like? Well, I, I, first of all, I, I agree with Lee. I think that what I've experienced in my time here is that many of the people who live there and have property value the Art League. They're very active in supporting it. I think one of the things in the, in the past couple of months, we've, we've really worked with the town leadership and they've worked with us to to talk through what are the concerns. And it, it really comes down, I think, to a fear of expansion, a fear that we're going to grow so big that we will disrupt or our activities would disrupt the, the character of the community. And and we understand that that concern and, and actually have really worked hard to prevent that that reality, so to speak. I mean, as as Lee mentioned, we have this wonderful annual outdoor show. It is by far the greatest impact, but we also invest in shuttles 
so that we can encourage people to park in other locations and we bring them in. And I think the community and the and especially the local, the neighbors who are right next to us have mentioned how much they appreciate that. So the the, the basis of 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 moving forward with a, a zone or a cultural district or not doing it seems to be resided in what this future possibility is of our expansion. And one of the things that we, um, as we've talked with our neighbors, particularly over the last couple of years, and also recognizing, as Lee mentioned, the growth in the broader community, and particularly as more and more people reside in the region year-round, is that where we are located does not really completely serve the need as it comes to art education. And in the past couple of years, we have been doing some programming in partnership with other art organizations outside of the community. And we actually um, this fall announced the opening of a satellite facility for the very purpose of not only being able to improve how we can uh, offer art programming, and meet the needs of the artists that are coming into the community, but also it allows us to grow our programming in a way that doesn't directly impact the historic campus. And at the same time, we also uh, developed a master campus plan, which we have shared with uh, directly with some of the neighbors who who think it's great, is we've shown how over time the enhancement of the property is really designed to preserve and protect its its character as well. Because over these 75 years, it has become a historic and cultural institution. And so therefore, our bringing in whatever the fear is, massive you know, programmings, would not fit with the character. But we also can't walk away from that property. We have a responsibility to steward it. The historic Peter Marsh Homestead is on there, the historic Painter Studio, and all of the rich traditional traditions that are there from the Members Fine Arts Show or Holiday Fair, all of them are what creates part of the character of our property and then ultimately, I think, Enloop and Acres. And so folks are really appreciative of the effort that we've done to uh, seek to to grow our programming in, in places where people can access it more easily, but also to protect and preserve. And we feel that by our publicly coming out with those plans We've communicated that with the town, that we have done everything we possibly can do to say, listen, we really, we understand that um, this place is special and we want it to remain special too, but we, we need some protection here. We, we, it's very difficult to operate when governmental policies are designed to eliminate um, us over time. So I think that what with the residents, particularly, I think that they are are finding that our plan and strategy meets what their what their hopes and dreams are as well. Now, now when you talk to the to the, the town leadership, do they seem to be satisfied with the, or semi satisfied or whatever to your assurances, uh, or, or are they sending their comprehensive plan with its residential zoning to the to this to the state? I mean, what, what's happening there? Um, well, we had some fabulous conversations this summer, and I think there's a greater appreciation and understanding both the town's understanding of what we do and what we're trying to do in the future, and also for us understanding what our um, neighbors are concerned about. Unfortunately, as it relates to the, the the future plan of the town, they have chosen to keep it as a future land use as residential. And... Uh, so in that regard, we were not successful in, in changing their minds to, to address that. But um, we're, we're um, well, we're, you know, we just continue to remain hopeful that we can continue to have this conversation and, and over time uh, be able to, to move forward with something that would permanently protect and, and, and ensure the longevity of and the sustainability of our cultural institution. Yeah, and has the state indicated whether or not it's going to accept or reject this this plan, this this plan that the, the state? That well, the the, city has? Um, the head of the planning commission has attended some of the town meetings and has expressed concerns that uh, th- this is the third submission of the cons- comprehensive plan. The first one in two thousand and four identified that this zoning was an issue and needed to be addressed. The um, review that was submitted in 2012 also identified that this was an issue and needed to be addressed. So she has stated, if you know that if you've identified that this needs to be addressed, then you should address it. 
And in this current draft, uh, it does not. Now, so if this is zoned as residential, does that mean that people are looking at this with the idea that these structures, particularly historic structures, that they could be torn down and you could just simply have a housing complex? I mean, a housing development? Is that, I mean... The way the code is written, um, is well, certainly if, if, the, if, the, if any of our structures are damaged beyond 80%, we cannot rebuild them. And the town's future land use... And the town is is also um, has the ability to, um, like, if ever the art league went away, the town would have the first right of refusal as far as purchasing the property. Um, but that is the way the future land use is set up. That if our buildings and our uses go away, then yes, it becomes residential use. Mm. So, is, is there some sense about? Um the way things are now, um, if, if if the state were to, for instance, accept what what the uh, what the city has, has put forward, that, that it becomes residential, is is it your understanding that you may still, as an as as institution and a structure housing structure, continue to be on the land, or is it possible that that it could then be turned around? I mean, as long as we continuously yeah. operate without any interruption, okay, yeah. uh, and as long as our buildings. Are standing. There's no. Um, we can continue to operate. Our our uses are grandfathered. The code is structured that if there was an interruption, or there was damage to the buildings, we could not come back. And part of um, some of the past challenges have been how the government has interpreted what our grandfathered uses are, and 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 so there's been some issues over the past. Lee mentioned contention. Some of that comes from the interpretation of what certain folks might think we should or should not be able to do. And what we had hoped to avo- hope to settle is through the creation of a cultural zone, you would actually articulate what goes on on that property that's permitted. And it, and all that, you know, non unconditional, non-conditional stuff would, right. would go away. So, so what kind of limits are there then that you would face if it, if it goes through and say it's residential, but obviously this is a continuous, uh, a usage as, as you as you place it. What what kind of limits does that put on you in terms of not only the buildings but also your activities? Well, I think that in the recent past, it's it's really been the the regulatory actions of the town as far as um, trying to restrict what we can do. And so there's a difference of opinion, I guess, in what we understand our grandfathered uses are and what they might interpret. And so I guess in that case, that would continue. If there's no resolution, it would be difficult to to define that. Um, there also have been, again, I think it comes back to the governmental policies, uh, c- questions about how we use our buildings. And so we've had some difficulty in the past getting permits to make restorations on the historic property, again, based upon our, the buildings being uh, non-conforming. So as we, with our master campus plan, we feel that we have addressed some of the concerns that we think that the town might bring up. But ultimately, in this vague area of, of grandfathered and non-conforming, it really becomes then subject to the individuals who might be in the position to make the yes or no at, at the time versus a set of clear codes that typically a town uses. And so we, we, we have continued to emphasize that our intent is to preserve the, the historic art and cultural activities, and it is our hope that, um, God forbid, there was some type of natural disaster and, and there was an impact on our buildings, that um, we, had, we had resolved this issue so that we were not in a position where um, we didn't have the ability to, to bring our buildings back. Now, I also understand there was a, a memor- memorandum of understanding that, that was offered, and as I understand, that the league rejected it. What what was the situation with the memorandum of understanding? Uh, that was a draft document mm-hmm. that the um, planning commission had submitted to us to look at, and uh, we notified the town. Actually, the planning commission first, and then the town commissioners that our council had advised us that it was contract zoning, which is actually illegal in the state of Delaware. And um, and so at, at, at this point, the, we couldn't move forward with, with an agreement that's illegal. 
So in terms of um, – Lee, want to turn to me. So in terms of the significance of this um, – this art league and its structure, what kind of impact do you see it having on the uh, the community and particularly as the community changes? Is it is it is, is, it, is the art league having a, an impact on the local residents there directly, do you think? Uh, or or has it over time been separated out from maybe the, the changing of the residents? You indicated that a lot of the original folks there had come and gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, it indicated a moment ago that uh, some of the, the heirs have departed as well? Is, is this league having as much influence, do you think, or impact on the local residents, the surrounding immediate residents there? Well, I really can't speak to specifics. Um, yeah. When when I first retired from uh, my jobs, you know, back in the Washington, D.C. area, and I came over, I took the gallery associate job, and uh, part of my duties there were uh, managing membership. So I got to know a lot of people and their renewals and all that stuff, but I haven't, that's that's uh, I left that position in 2003, so I, I really don't know um, the whole makeup of, of our current membership, aside from the fact uh, with my connection, which is pretty broad and pretty deep with artists in the community, and, um, and there are plenty of us there and almost all of us at every level of artistic achievement maintain our membership there. We, it's, a, it's an important thing for us. Um, it's an important institution. It embodies um, everything we are and, and everything that we do. Um, the most professional of us teach for the Art League occasionally, sometimes often. Um, we all participate in the Members Fine Art exhibitions. Many of us participate in the outdoor show. Um, we, When people are asking us, you know, I'd, I've always wanted to learn how to do watercolor. We send them to the Art League for their first classes. Uh, so in that sense, you know, it's it's a broad, broadly cast net artistically. Um, I can't speak to um, how individual new homeowners in, in Henlope and Acres actually think or respond to that because I, I just don't have the experience with it. Um, but um, it, it, I would also add that... Uh, the Art League is a collecting institution. So it's a repository f- for um, a lot of the the fine work that's been created here in the region over the long haul. I mean, we have, we have works of art from the founding members. We have works of art from current members. Um, we are always in a position to take new pieces into our collection. Uh, the... the uh, Permanent Collection Committee meets monthly, discusses all these things, working continuously to to uh, monitor uh, the care and maintenance of the collection, which is very, very expensive. And, um, and it's one of the things that we're all very excited about, having the stables uh, retrofitted to house the collection now. We can have it on campus where it belongs as part of, you know, the history of the place. It's been in storage units, um, you know, cared for it. We, we're doing well by it, but it really, I mean, it's a part of who we are, and it should be on that campus and be accessible. Sheila, do, do you have any sense about how many people who are residents in Hinlope and Acres are actually members of the Art League? Well, the, the residents is a small percentage of who are property owners there, because uh-huh. again, it is oh. a, the, mm-hmm. the community is made up of second homes, third homes, so um, of the people who are their year round, um, probably about 60, 65 percent mm-hmm. um, are members or financially contribute or volunteer at the Art League. You know, something that Lee said, if I could add on, is, you know, the Art League's impact is really regional. And uh, our artists come from um, around the region, actually, as far away as California, Alaska, and Florida. But beyond that, uh, the Art League provides art education to what will become the next generation of artists, and not just artists, but but people who value and appreciate art. We have a wonderful visual arts outreach program through partnerships with First State Community Action Agency, some of the school districts, and we provide free art education to, um, over the course of a year, nearly 800 children in some of the, you know, the low economic communities in Sussex County. And we send artists out there on a, on a regular basis, weekly, to work with these children. And we're really proud of that because 
the, there's been a ton of studies that have shown that when children who are who are in situations that make it harder for them to be successful, engagement with the arts improves their self-esteem, helps them with their problem solving, and ultimately they've been tied it, tied it back to academic achievement. So, so we not only benefit the, the artists who are seeking to advance their profession and their skills, but reach beyond that to enhance the quality of life in the community. And from an economic standpoint, standpoint um, as a cultural institution, there are many people who travel to the region not only to see the beaches but to engage in the cultural activities. And so the Art League is an economic contributor to the, to the region as well. And, and I think that not only do the residents of Henlopen and Acres support that, but the broader community. We have a very large um, number of people who support the Art League, whether, again, through volunteerism, through membership, uh, their financial com- uh, contributions. And, and, it, and it reaches up, up into to Wilmington. We partner with organizations across the state in order to be able to provide quality art programming. And so I think that... Um, Ultimately, we know that the community supports us. It's just figuring out how to to create a sustainable situation where our our homestead is located as we continue to meet the needs of the community in providing art and cultural experiences. Please, okay, before we let go, so what? You're an artist. What 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 kind of art do you produce? What, what kind well, of I person? um I I work uh, in collage for the most part and assemblage. I like. Uh, I like working with some found objects, but almost most of my work recycles itself. Um, that uh, I, I guess you would say that I'm sort of a, uh, an aging abstract expressionist. You know, I got I got I got born a few years late to hit the first tide. Um, but um, but in in doing my collage work, I try to re- recycle gestures and and um, action on on the paint surface and stuff and. Um, and I've enjoyed some success at it. I, you know, I've got gallery representation, and and uh, people respond, and it's it's a good thing. I love it. It's, it's, now, let me ask you this: uh, So, how important has has, has having the this place uh, to go? I mean, oh, it's it... it's hugely important. You know, I can remember um, as a little boy hearing about the Art League. I didn't get a chance to visit it as a child. Um, um, we didn't often um, get to the beach over here. And of course, I was an army brat, so we were traveling a lot anyway. But um, but f- my Baltimore family um, usually took a house for the summer somewhere in, in Roboth. And, and when I, my family and I were in town, I would be invited to come down and 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 um, and then at, through high school, I knew about the about the art league. Um, I went away to college. When I came back, um, I took a studio at the old mill at Savage, and uh, and we carpool to bring works down um, to the Art League. Um, at that time, there were there was a there was the Saxon Swan Gallery in Lewis, and he was very interested in bringing artists into the region too. So so we would take work to him, and we take work to the Art League, um, and then it you know um, as as my partner and I got more successful and, and we got a summer house here, then I started doing more volunteer work with the Art League and then retirement comes and you live here and you're much more engaged. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a lifelong activity. I, uh, you know, they're going to take me out in a paint box. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were speaking with uh, Lee Mills. He is a, a longtime member of the Art League, the Robot Art League, as well as an artist, as we just heard. Also, Sheila Bravo, she's the executive director of the Art League. And we've been talking about the zoning dispute that's uh, grown up in Henlopen Acres. And uh, we wish you both well and appreciate you stopping by. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Del Marva Today. I'm Don Rush, and thanks for listening. This has been Del Marva Today, a production of Del Marva Public Radio. Chris Rank produces and is our audio engineer. Don Rush is your host. For podcasts, visit our website, delmarvapublicradio.net, or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast in iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on PAC 14. To view the schedule, visit the Daily Times or visit pac14.org.